before you, well, so-and-so is not doing it. So-and-so let me down. We repent of letting that be our excuse not to follow the perfect one. Went to the cross because of the joy laid before him. We look only unto you. We ask you to strengthen us now. Holy Spirit, come now and empower us for a new day. Empower us for a new reality. Empower us for a day where victory after victory comes into our lives. Empower us for a day where our faith does not fail in the middle of hardship, where our, our hope doesn't disappoint. Empower us for a day and set our heart in heavenly things. Restore us and renew us to that anchor, that hope, which is an anchor for our soul, which is set in behind the veil, where nothing can touch it. Lord, we ask you now, can you just lay your hands on your heart, pray for your own heart. You know, you have authority to do that. Your heart belongs to you again. That's the first gift of salvation. We got our hearts back. It's not a slave to sin anymore. It's ours again. So we bless our heart. The authority vested in us by the presence of Christ in us. We say, heart, you will not grow weary in well-doing. Heart, you will not faint before the due season in which we reap that which we've sowed. Heart, you will remain, remain steadfast in the Lord. Heart, you will not be downcast. You will not stay in a place of despair. Heart, you will put your trust in God yet again. Heart, you will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Heart, you will not be eternally disappointed. Hope again. Get your hopes up in Jesus' name, heart of mine. Get your hope back in heavenly places. And we speak truth to the lie. God has not disappointed you. God has not forsaken you. God has not let you down. God has not abandoned you. He has been with you all along. Open your eyes. Open your eyes, heart. Even as we sang, we say that song we sang right now. We take authority in that. Open the eyes of my heart. We proclaim it. Not just a song, it's a command. We ask you, Lord, for great grace to overcome those things that became like a veil over our mind's eye, over our heart's eye. We will see you as you really are. There, there's an anointing on this moment. I, I agree with Pastor Steve. And so before we sing, I will make room for you. I, I'll declare this over your life. Okay, declare it before you, it's kind of like this declaration you're making before you walk away from this place. I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, do whatever you want to. sacrificing to him watch him to do new things in your life he's going to break forth in new things in your marriages in relationships to your kids and your grandkids to your parents to your grandparents he's going to send some of you forth into ministry like you've never known before as you surrender more to God he lifts you up when we bow low he lifts us up and he's going to break new things out of you. I, I declared in the name of Jesus over this church and over this valley. Whew, watch out, Millersburg. Watch out, Lycans Valley. As you surrender to him, watch him move in mighty ways in your life. Declare it. He is good and he is faithful every single time. Every single time. One more time. And I will make room. 
whenever you want to, whenever you want to, and I will make room for you. walking these um, beaches that the tide goes out and it's really beautiful sand and it's just nice and flat so was, she'd never heard the footprints poem before so it felt like a little bit of a it was a dad fail moment so I got to tell it to you so we we'd made our footprints in the sand and you know you know this this right do I have to tell it you all know it one night a man had a dream he was walking on the beach with the Lord along the sky flash scenes from his life and he noticed with every image there were two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to him, one belonging to the Lord. And then he noticed during certain seasons of his life, the hardest moments of his life, there was only one set of footprints in the sand. And he looked at the Lord, he said, Lord, how could you abandon me when I needed you most? I noticed in all these dark times in my life, there's only one set of footprints in the sand. Where did you go when you needed me? He says, son, son, I would love you and I will never leave you or forsake you. Those times in your life when you felt alone, it was then that I carried you. So Tay and I made our footprints in the sand together, walking, and she's barely making any dent in the sand, and I felt fatter than I've ever felt in my life with how big my footprints were. And we're walking along, we made them, and then I picked her up and I carried her for a few, and I said, wait, there's one more addition to this poem that I've learned in, in Walking with the Lord. So I, I said, just get down, and I dragged her for a few feet. And, and so we added a section to that. Lord, what's that? You know, what are those skid marks? He goes, oh, that's when I dragged you kicking and screaming. <laughs> and sometimes it's like that with the Lord, but how many of you know, it's so much easier to just say, yes, Lord. It's so much easier. I just heard a story about a woman whose mom, um, she's a great woman of faith, and her mom over her bed just had a gigantic painted mural, and it just said, yes, Lord. And that's a, that's a fascinating, beautiful way to live life. Because saying yes, Lord, means I don't know what your request is, but I already know the answer is yes. How many of you would like to grow in your ability to hear the voice of God? This is your first, this is your first tip, pro tip. If you're hearing the voice of God, have your heart ready to say yes, Lord, no matter what you hear. Because we learn to tune God's voice out sometimes. And he becomes like all the adults in the Charlie Brown cartoons. Wah, 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 wah. And we can do that with the Spirit's voice. Or we could just say, my heart says yes, Lord, automatically, no matter what it is you're about to say. Oh yeah, kids, children's church has begun. You can go meet your teachers in the back. God bless you and have an awesome time back there in the kids' church. Praise God. I do want to exhort you um, about the gathering for worship today at the square. It's 4 o'clock 
It's the Church of Lycans Valley. We have a network now. The Lord's uh, given us a refresh in our pastor's network. I put word out, hey guys, would you like to get together again and let's expand it. We now have 30 churches that are connecting. Pastors are coming together. We're praying. I mean, not everybody makes all the meetings in that. It's just like everything else. But we meet, we pray, we strategize together. We've determined certain things that we feel like this is where we need to cooperate with one another, regardless of where we stand on how to do church. We all believe Jesus is Lord. We all agree that, man, if we just worship, there's nothing we're going to disagree about in that setting. I mean... Then there's, well, what songs are we going to sing? You know, none of that. But we have today, there'll be seven churches represented, I believe, on the worship team, if I'm not mistaken. It's at 4 o'clock. And I want to exhort you this way. First of all, we do need two crossing guards. You don't have to have training. That's nice if you do. But we have a state trooper who's going to be in charge of it, and there's only four. I think we're all right. So anybody who can serve that way, arrive at 3.30. Just let me know before you leave today that you could do that. Second, I want to exhort you to prioritize it. This is the Lord summoning the Church of Lycans Valley. This is not just, hey, let's do an event together. Want to be nice? Look, the church is getting along. We can do, you know, the, the psalm. Behold how good and pleasant it is when the brothers dwell together in unity. It's not like that. This is the Lord saying, I want my people gathered together and I want them to swing wide the gates and welcome the presence of the Lord into Millersburg. If you don't know, there are events being planned. It's Pride, so-called Pride Month now, but in August there's an event being planned, a Pride event. And um, that, that just speaks to me that there's been a crack. There's an open door right now where the enemy believes that he has access, that he has room to establish his kingdom in a more prominent way than, than before. If we sit back silently, and if we just go about having American summer, where it's cookouts, it's picnics, it's vacations, it's beach, and all that's well and good. But if that's all that summer means to us and we leave the door wide open for the enemy, rather than swinging wide the gates and saying, come in, King of glory, then we have no one to blame. Really, when it comes down to it, wherever a nation goes is where the church is already gone. That's just the truth. It's historically true. I can prove it to you in any nation that's ever had the gospel preached. If the church remains strong, we remember who we are, we continue not only to, to preach good news, which we've got to do. You know, there are some who are, who are ministering things out there, and it is to them like a ministry going after our young ones especially with all kinds of doctrines to say, now forget God's way, just go this way. This way is better. And they're as adamant about it, almost like evangelists are in the church. I heard a statistic that 80% of those who are connected with some of the really big pride organizations do believe that they make it, it's like a life purpose to convert. They, call, they use the word convert as many as they can to believe that way about sexuality. 80%. I was sitting in a meeting with some intercessors and pastors and I, I just began to weep when I heard this. Man, what if 80% of the church was that adamant about bringing good news wherever we went? What if 80% of the church was looking at people as those who right now, they, they might have darkness in their life, they might have a disconnect from heaven, but what if 80% of us said, I'm not going to settle for that. I can't just see somebody out there drowning and not do anything about it. What if we were that way? I thought that was going to be happier. <laughs> Four o'clock today, we're joining together to minister to the Lord. And it is vital. There are many things the church should be doing. We should be engaged in every sphere of influence, from schools to government to everything. We should be the hands-on, most hands-on people to protect everything that the Lord's given us as a blessing here in our nation. But first and foremost, we have spiritual authority, and if we fail to exercise it, somebody else will. Who has no problem, the usurper has no problem trying to overtake the kingdom of heaven. He will always be at work doing that. He has no, as Patty so well exhorted a couple of weeks ago, he still has power, but he has no authority unless we loan him ours. So let's not loan the enemy any authority for a day longer. Let's establish the authority of the United Church of Jesus Christ, the saints of God, and lift up a sound that they could hear it up in Lycans today. Amen? All right, so 4 o'clock, I'll see you there, and I'll see at least two of you at 3.30. <laughs> I do want to thank all of you who ministered yesterday at the Celebration of Life for Sarah Flannery, I see your family here today. God bless you guys. Thank you for the honor of allowing us to celebrate her like that. I was sharing with Cindy a little while ago how their, their memorial, I've done a few memorial services, thankfully a lot more weddings than memorial services, but um, there are some 
where the life that you're celebrating is a message in itself. Like you, don't, you almost didn't need to open the scripture because Sarah's life was a living epistle. The way she held on to the Lord, the way she remained steadfast and immovable. My, I'll never, for as long as I live, that chair that Rebecca's sitting in right now is like a sanctified place in this house. The last conversation I had with her with a beaming smile, like you know her smile, it was just captivating. With a beaming smile, holding on to faith, holding on to hope. She had absolutely not, she had moments, I'm sure, I didn't get to see any of those moments, but she never once turned her face away from God. She reminded me of Job, who's the, he's like the template for all the people of faith. You know, Job existed before there was a Bible. So, you know, we can be encouraged when we read stories like Job, if any of you take the time to do it. It's like, it starts out really exciting, and then it's like, a lot of chapters of whining and arguing and like, oh, blah, 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 blah. and then God finally speaks and it's great. But Job, it says of him, he, he said, after all these things came upon him, he said, even if he kills me, I'll still praise his name. And that was Sarah. So we had among us a living example of how it's done. And I hope you all were taking notes as I was, because that's how to do it. She fought the good fight of faith and won. Amen? All right. So speaking of fighting the good fight of faith and winning, let's get back to David. I miss him. I miss David. I mean, I've been in him and meditating on him, and I just absolutely love his life. But I wanted to share, share something about it. It's, it's a trust in God's sovereignty. And then we're going to share a moment. If, you're, if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel. What are we up to? 20, 26? 26. Yeah, 1 Samuel 26, if you have your Bible. There's so many moments that I love about David, so many moments where I fall in love with him all over again. This one, well, it's my favorite today because that's what we're sharing about. Everyone I'm reading about, I'm falling in love with him all over again. But this is going to be the second time that he had opportunity to take revenge and put an end to his suffering. And if David would have killed Saul at any point in time during this stage of his journey, it, the Bible could have literally read and God handed David handed Saul over to the hands of his enemy. David killed him, and the nation had peace. And none of us in reading the Scriptures would have thought twice about it. And we would never have known in the natural until Jesus came what it looks like to so be confident in God, to so have a trust in the sovereign hand of God that we don't take matters into our own hands and make something happen, not even the prophetic word of the Lord. And if you're like me, which I know you all are, as soon as you hear what God has in mind, you start offering ideas on how to get it done. I heard like three of you chuckle, but I know all of you know exactly what I'm talking about. All of you at home know exactly what I'm talking about. God has it. And he said, this is what I'm going to do with your life, and this is what you're going to be, and this is where you're going to go, and, and, and all of that. And you go, I know exactly how to get there. And heaven just goes, nah. Something like that. There's some kind of chuckle that goes on between the angels, and they go, so this is going to be interesting to watch this journey. And, and we're looking through David's life and taking such a lengthy season. I don't think I've ever preached a series this long before, but I really feel like God wants to show us things on how to get there. As, as the Lord, I think, ministered prophetically this morning, there, there are so many of us in the body of Christ who start out strong, like Israel when they left Egypt and said they were going out boldly, it says. They were all excited. 10 plagues, we're free. Pharaoh's been judged, we're going to the promised land, they were going out boldly, then came their first problem, and everything fell apart immediately. And we're not going to be like that. We're going to be like David, and all of us are destined to be as David, who have obstacle after obstacle. The Word of God tested David, just like it was said of Joseph, all the way through his life. If David didn't know that he was called to be the next king of Israel, imagine what he would have done at any point in time. But he held on to what God said, and today I want to look at how David um, just trusted that God was able to fulfill his word. No word of God is without power. There is nothing that God's ever said to any of us that didn't come with a package, if you will, of the power for that word to come to pass. All of it does. Like a seed has life on the inside. It has power to become whatever plant or tree it's destined to. It's just that there's a process in the middle. And I want none of us to fall apart on the way in, on that process. 
I don't want any of us having the wheels fall off the wagon or pick your metaphor, whatever you like, on our way to destiny. I want all of us to go into the promised land together as one. That's, that's my passion for us. It's my passion for each of you. And yeah, for my own life. I intend to end well. Sarah's life encouraged me. Remember to end like that. Remember to go down in faith. If you are going to go down before you get to be 120, then go down in faith. So we, um, we're, we're in an interesting place as a nation right now, aren't we? That's one word to describe it. There are many words to describe it. We're in a fascinating place right now. And it, it's, I'm not even going to say it because we've been saying for the last 20 years, the next election, man, it's like, it's the most important election of our lives. I'm verged out on that one myself. And I, as I share with you, I think years ago, I've repented of that mindset. Like the kingdom of heaven depends on who wins the next election for whatever office. It means a lot and it means nothing all at the same time because the kingdom of heaven will always overcome. It is important, however, that the church gets back to our appropriate place of authority and we're the head and not the tail. What that looks like is we are at the forefront of making current events, not just reading about and commenting on current events. I don't know about you, but I am tired. I don't want any more. I don't even talk to anybody about politics anymore. Sometimes it leaks out. <laughs> what is that? Thank you, Jesus. He's not going to do it anymore. <laughs> oh, is that a, yeah, we agree with you. I'm not doing it either anymore. It, it's hard not to because there are decisions being made that do affect our lives profoundly. There are things that our government can do or shouldn't or isn't doing that changes everything about our day-to-day -day lives, right? A little child shall lead them was a curse that God gave saying, you're going to have immature people in charge and your nation's going to fall to pieces. When righteous rule, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. So we can't leave that out. But we got to remember that where the church goes, the nation goes. That's what it means to be the head. Wherever the head goes, that's where the rest goes. I, I biked on these bike trails that I used to ride in, out on the tip of Cape Cod. They're beautiful sand dunes, and you're riding up and down the hills. You get this panoramic view of the ocean as you're going through. And, and on at least four of the hills, about halfway up, I got off my bike because I'm not 17. And they're really steep. But I remembered uh, when I was a teenager flying around on those hills and there was one in particular, I had a really big turn and I used to challenge myself, how fast can I go down around that turn? <laughs> uh, you already know how this ends, don't you? <laughs> so I was flying down the hill and I had it. I, I had it uh, and I was ready to make the turn, but I kept looking at the side because they're these, um, uh, they're called uh, beach, beach plums, bushes, and they're little spiky things on them. And they're on the side of the trail where if, you, know, you go off, you go into, I kept looking at those. And I kept thinking, don't hit the beach plums, don't hit the beach plums. And you know what I did, right? Hit the beach plums. And went right into it. We have got to be a people who remain focused on the path in front of us and stop looking to the left and looking to the right. There is something that God has in store and where we go, where our head is looking. You know how to drive in, there's all these driving metaphors now. I learned to drive in New York City. It's like here in town, you know, in the, in the side streets here, they're two-way, but everybody stops. Like, there's room for two trucks to pass each other, but people will pull over and let your little, you know, your little mini car go, go through because, you know, because people like that much space between the cars. So where I learned to drive, you got this much space between your mirror and your neighbor's mirror. All the Philly people said amen. <laughs> so I learned when you're driving through those Jersey barriers, you know, they're, um, they're <laughs> I was going to make a comment about Jersey, but I'm not. Be quiet. Stop. Get back. Get away. All right. So what you got to do is not look at the Jersey barriers. You have to look at the road in front of you. If you look at the Jersey barriers, your car begins to drift into it. That's what it means to be the head. In the body of Christ, we've been looking at too many different things instead of fixing our eyes on Jesus and remembering what our role is and how the nation will follow wherever we go. So we want to have leaders, right? We would like to have people in governmental authority. We want people in authority in our churches, in our communities, in our schools. We want people of authority who are after God's heart, but that's going to require the people to be after the same thing. That's why a moment of consecration like we just did this morning is so important. Because if the people of God aren't purposed 
toward God. If the, if the people of God have forgotten who we are and we're off doing our own thing, everyone to their tents, everyone take care of your own family, take care of your own needs, and that's, that's all that matters, then no wonder the nation. Nature abhors a vacuum, and the kingdom of darkness would be happy to drive if we abandon the wheel. And so David, as he walked through his journey, just manifested this in such a profound way. So let's look at 1 Samuel 26. This is, um, I'll, I'll catch you up on the story in a week or two. We'll, we'll do a summary to get everybody on board. But it says, Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding on the hill of Hachila, which is before Jeshimon? Those Ziphites, man, they are the worst rats. And it, look, why you got to go tell them? It's like, you ever play hide and seek? And, and somebody like, tells the guy who's it where you're hiding. That's the Ziphites. It's like that's all they do. That's the only purpose they have in the Scriptures, to tell Saul where David's hiding. Uh, they just irritate me. I'm sure they were nice people. But anyway, so Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having with him 3,000 chosen men of Israel, a search for David in the wilderness of Ziph. Now Saul camped in the hill of Hachilah, which is before Jeshimon, beside the road, and David was, uh, was staying in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul came after him in the wilderness, David sent out spies, and he knew that Saul was definitely coming. So David then arose and came to the place where Saul had camped. And David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army, and Saul was lying in the circle of the camp, and the people were camped around him. So David said to Ahimelech the Hittite and Abishai the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, so this is Joab's nephew, who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, oh, I'll go down with you. And you'll see why in a moment. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping inside the circle of the camp with his spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the people were lying around him. You know, one red flag for leadership. I'm saying this because who here is called to leadership? Mm -hmm. It's not enough hands. Who's called to leadership? There you go. You have Christ in you, right? Christ in you is always in charge. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Christ, and Christ is in you. So we embody the authority of Jesus Christ wherever we go. That's leadership. I'm not saying you have to be in charge of a company or in charge of a group of people. Carrying authority doesn't mean you boss people around. In fact, the, 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 the worst people to be in authority are the ones who like being in charge. I don't like serving. Um, I mean, when people like bossing people around and they like having authority, that's why so many who run for office and so many who serve in government, the biggest problem is they like being in charge. It's fun to boss people around for some. So that's why, we, you know, everything I learned, I learned in kindergarten. We've got to remember how to say, you're not the boss of me. You know. <laughs> so there's Saul. He's in the middle. He's got everybody around him protecting him. He's out hunting David, who's got 600. He's got 3,000 elite soldiers of Israel. And he's in the middle, putting everyone else around him at risk to serve his purpose. That is terrible leadership. Where does a leader belong? Out in front. As David. A leader belongs, I'm going to be the point of the spear. That's the heart of leadership. I will bear the brunt of the assault. All of us are called, whoever it is that depends on us, whoever in our life, whether it be our family and friends, whether it be people maybe have actual authority and you lead within your organization somehow, or whether it's the neighborhood surrounding you who has no access to heaven while all hell is breaking loose. Those people are depending on us to be the tip of the spear, to put ourselves at risk, to put everything right up and until our lives on the line for the sake of protecting. That's leadership. And here's Saul in the middle. And what's he got stuck in the ground right next to his head? That spear. And he's probably like, man, I missed him three times. I'm not going to miss him next time. Probably told his guys, you find David, you catch up with him, you hold him for me. Because he's wily, he's squirrely, he keeps getting away. I'm going to run that spear right through him. And he's just mad, crazy mad about David because of his jealousy. So 
I'm just pausing on that moment to urge you to guard your heart and be careful as the Lord grows you in authority, as the Lord grows you, as you get more and more responsibility to never fall for the lie that it's all about you. It's never all about us. It's all about us in the sense that we've got to be good stewards of what we carry, and it's not about us in the sense that it's about everyone that we're called to serve. There's no gift of God, there's no grace of God, there's no anointing of God that's ever just for ourselves. It's always for the benefit of others. That's what gifts are for. Amen? All right. So Abishai said to David, here's why Abishai, Joab's nephew, we'll see more about Joab when David becomes king. But suffice to say that he has the same spirit. Abishai said to David, today God has delivered your enemy into your hand. Now we already saw what you did when you had him in the cave. And we already know that you're not going to do anything. You're not going to take any action on this. So let me strike him with the spirit of the ground. In one stroke, I don't need a second shot. I'll hit him on the first time. Why don't you let me do your dirty work for you, David? And David's response, as we'll see in a moment, is absolutely astounding yet again. But if we find ourselves ruled by leaders who are full of pride and full of self-will, then we should ask God why they have his permission to rule. How did Saul become king again? The people asked. The people rejected being led by a prophet because then they would have to be responsible to the Lord for their lives and not blame a king for all their problems. Oh, here's a little smoke detector for your spirit. The next time we find ourselves complaining, the next time you find yourself complaining about a decision made in government, ask yourself, why am I complaining about that instead of looking to the Lord to be my source right now? What is it that I've shifted my dependency toward a governing official and away from the Lord about? Now, I'm not saying there's not plenty to complain about and the things that need to be fixed and right. I'm talking about an attitude of the heart. Why do they have permission to rule? The people said, Give us a king, just like all the other nations have a king. So God said, okay, here's a king, just like the kings of all the other nations. In other words, the people of God, this was not a democracy or a republic. This was a kingdom. And the people's request was exactly what they got, only they didn't understand what they were going to get. They thought, hey, this would be great. It'll be just like all the other nations. We'll have a king to fight our battles and, and rule over us, and it's going to be great. And then they found out that living under a king who doesn't carry God's heart is even more miserable than being self-reliant and self-dependent. All the more in a nation like ours, we have direct access to the Father. There's nothing we're looking to government for that we should be looking to the Father for. That's the beginning of it. Why does somebody have permission to rule? Why do the unrighteous have permission to rule in a place where we elect those? I mean, it is the, it's unprecedented in human history to have what we have for as long as we've had it. Why is it that we would have people who are corrupt, people who are unrighteous judges in places? Why do we have governing officials who are self-willed and self-oriented? Well, because the church has allowed it to happen. And maybe because we've lived that way ourselves. That's why the promise that God made on the day the first temple was dedicated, he said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn away from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven. If my people who are called by my name always comes back, the buck stops here. No, it does. The buck really does stop here. If a nation slides off and darkness begins to overcome, it's only because a bushel has been placed over the light. That's the only way it can happen. And so we look to ourselves and we look to the Lord and say, God, we turn away from that. Seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways. Not, hey, those, those people are doing all these wicked things. No, no, no. What are my people called by my name doing that open the door for this demonic spirit? that literally built like a landing strip for it, that swung wide a gate so that all hell could break loose. We're called to prevail against the gates of hell, not open them into a culture. And there's lots of ways that we could do that. So we just need to be awake and aware of that. So we have this king, Saul. He was demonized. He was, he was completely rejected by God. And, and, but, but what David understood about God, and Paul wrote it in Romans, that God's call and his gifts are without repentance. That once God puts an assignment on somebody and he, he pours an anointing, you know, in the old covenant days, 
anointing oil, oil was literally poured on the head, first of the head of the high priest. And it had some spices that you could smell the high priest from a hundred yards away when he walked up. Because that anointing's on him. You cannot get that smell out of those garments. You just can't. And when God anoints somebody, you can't unanoint somebody. And God does not unanoint somebody. That's the, the reason why we have people that seem to have an anointing to mislead people. Because they were given and anointed for leadership and God didn't withdraw it just because they took that gift and anointing and are using it for darkness. It happens all the time. Look throughout the scriptures. It happens all the time. And it's happening right here in the story that we're going through. Saul is still anointed king. And until that man dies, he is going to be king of Israel. God's calling His gifts are without repentance. So we are never called to remove a leader by usurping his or her authority. Usurping means to do it by illegal means, meaning we use the tools of darkness to accomplish a purpose that we believe is for the kingdom of light. Well, how do I know if somebody's anointed of God or not? How do I know if you know, this guy's anointed and this guy's not anointed by God? And maybe there is no way of knowing. Maybe we just have to be content to say God's sovereign enough, as David will do in a moment, to remove that person himself without us using illegal means to accomplish it. I, I can name somebody who is in David's genealogy just a few generations later who all the people thought this one is not anointed by God. This one is a false prophet, a false teacher, a false Messiah, and he deserves death because of that. And, and the judgment of all the people was in agreement. They spoke with one voice, crucify him. They all agreed. And that was Jesus Christ. It is so important that we honor what God honors and be like David. There is, however, a legal way in every system of government for leaders to be removed. There is, in our nation, all the more. In our entire constitution, by the way, is set up just to add this protection into government that the government will always be required to serve the people. And there is a legal way to do it. There's a legal way to remove a president, a senator, anybody, a Supreme Court judge can be impeached. They can all be removed from office, but there's a legal way to go about it or there's a way to get it done quicker where we partner with the kingdom of darkness. Now, I know I just started, I slipped into talking about government again, but this is vital that we are the people who recognize that there's a problem in government that's not where we look to the answer for the reason why there's a problem there. We look and say, Lord, what have we done to open the door for this? Have we been silent? Have we been neglectful in moving the kingdom of heaven forward? Have we neglected in the place of prayer? Have we failed to make a place? Have we not prioritized the place of prayer and the place of worship to say, come, we desire you. We say, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and we're going to live our lives accordingly. Maybe, what have we done that's allowed the enemy to move in where we should have been occupying that territory? It's where it always begins. We don't want to partner with the kingdom of darkness. So the spirit of usurping is when we say, we don't like what you're doing, and we are going to do whatever it takes, legal or illegal, to remove you from that. If David would have taken action against Saul right now, well, he would have invited a spirit into his own kingship and he would have been partnering with the kingdom of darkness to accomplish the purposes of God. How does that end? That never ends well. How many of you have experienced that personally? There are many ways to undermine a leader and not all of them involve a violent revolt. Most of the time we use our mouths or we use our keypad on our favorite social media site. And we cut down people in authority. And, and don't, don't be mistaken, it's not just the government government that we're talking about. We do it to our bosses, we do it to our parents, we do it to uh, church leaders, we, we do it to people in authority all the time. So if we don't want that kind of spirit ruling over a nation, we've got to repent of it first in our own lives and have the kind of respect for what God has anointed. God's call and his gifts are without repentance. So take a look at David's response to it. Verse 9, David says, 
to Abishai, don't destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be without guilt? David also said, as the Lord lives, surely the Lord will strike him, or his day will come that he dies, or he'll go down into battle and will perish, or something like that. But the Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but take his spear and take his jug of water and let's go. And the way the story ends is that David yells, he wakes everybody up, he yells out to um, Abner and he says, hey Abner, what are you doing sleeping? You failed, and you're, you're the king's bodyguard and look, I have his spear and his jug from right next to his head. You're sleeping on the job. Now in fairness to Abner, it does say that the Lord gave them a deep sleep. So we'll give the guy a break for a moment. But David's point was, dude, you just failed in your job. You deserve to be put to death for that. And he calls out to Saul and they have another one of these weird psychotic conversations where Saul, oh, my son David, who I'd love and want to kill with my spear. That I carried all these miles just so I could run it right through you again. You're, you're righteous and I'm not. He's, he's but just bipolar anyway. It's just a real mess with, with this man. But the only proper way to come into our kingdom call and authority is to remain humble and always serving and remember that promotion comes from the Lord. This is what David did. David had, he could still probably smell the anointing from when that prophet poured it over his head. And he knows, I am going to be king. But if I become king by these hands, then I'm going to have to remain king by these hands. If I usurp the authority of the present king, I've just opened the door to be usurped myself. Because as a man sows, so shall he reap. And I do believe that, you know, there's, there's been this feeling, you know, the elders, we're going to be meeting and praying again tomorrow night about it. And I've talked to so many of you too and so many others outside of Hillside. It just feels like this blanket of oppression right now. And I know most of us are experiencing it. It just feels like, a, I don't know, I don't know any other term to use, but it feels like a damp, heavy blanket. And it's, it's just like the general mood has been dampened and, and it's just despair is palpable with many people who normally aren't given to despair and hopelessness is around and anger and anxiety and all this, an all-time high. And it, it just feels like, man, something's going on with all of that. And so we're going to be meeting and praying into that and I urge you to do the same. But the reason, I believe, is because we're, it's spiritual authority. It's spiritual in nature. It's not because of X, Y, or Z. It's not, let's not be like the ancient Israelites and blame it on who's in the office right now. But let's look to the Lord and say, now how can I posture myself? Because I'm not subject to that kingdom. I'm a citizen of heaven. And I know that in that place, there is no anxiety. There's no fear. There's no hopelessness. Ever. Not for a moment. It's so loud and so full of exceeding joy that if I just spend one day in those courts, I'm ready for a thousand anywhere in the darkest pit of hell after a day in those courts. So David remained in this place where he said, I am not going to use the tools of darkness to accomplish the will of God. The original usurper, Satan himself, Isaiah 14 describes this fall that he had. You know, he was there and uh, how he fell from heaven. And then it says that what he said was, I will exalt myself above the throne of God. I will make my throne in the mountains of the east. I will be like God. Do you hear the, the phrase over and over again? I will, I will. It's like a, a perverted twist on what the Lord prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. Not thy will, but my, not my will, but thy will be done. He said, not thy will, but my will be done. It's what the first Adam did, right? David was refusing to enter in where so many miss out and so many fall short. And I'm, I'm pleading with you today, don't let it happen to you because we're all dependent. I'm dependent personally on all of us coming into the fullness of our call and not tripping up over one of these stumbling blocks. And I, I would suggest to you that having disrespect for authority that God has put in position, how much authority has God given? All of it. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Nobody has authority unless Jesus gives it permission. So a question to ask if you don't like the authority over us is, why has Jesus given that permission? Or rather, how have I given it permission? Because all demonic authority is borrowed authority. They have no authority 
in and of itself. If you didn't hear Patty's message from two weeks ago, I urge you to listen to it. She nailed it. She, she described it. She taught it rich, deep in the Word, and she was spot on in how she described it. Still have power, but no authority. So Jesus came to reverse what the first Adam did, to contradict what the devil himself caused or tempted Adam to do. And he, Jesus, it says, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. That's right out of Philippians 2. In other words, he didn't have to strive to be equal with God. He was God. He was the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. He didn't have to usurp authority. He already had it. So if anyone could have come into the earth and said, I'm in charge now, all of you bow. I am the king of all kings. Come on, kings, bow right here. Throw your crowns at my feet. It was Jesus, but instead, he came to show us a path to the throne that was completely other than how everybody else gets there. Because most people who come to positions of authority get there by political maneuvering, by you know, walking a certain steps, climbing the corporate ladder, pushing others down so that they themselves can be promoted. I shouldn't say most, maybe that's cynical. Many people do come into power by that or a position of authority that way. And Jesus was saying, I'm gonna remind you of what life's supposed to be like. You wanna be the greatest of all? Be the servant of all. You wanna be the one that can be entrusted with authority to move mountains? then you've got to get yourself so low that everybody else can walk over you. I'm going to give you big, broad shoulders, not so you could bully everybody, but so they're stronger, so you can lift people up into their destiny. That's the kind of authority I'm going to give you. So Jesus didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped after like the usurper did. He remained humble until God exalted him. At the end of that section in Philippians 2, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that's above every other name. So at that name, that name of Jesus, every knee will bow, both in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess he's Lord. How did he get there? Not by pushing people down, not by usurping, not by getting his own way, but by saying, not my will, but your will be done. I'm here to serve, Father. Who's next? Where's next? Satan did it the wrong way. Adam did it the wrong way. But we're going to do it the right way, amen? We are going to come into a place where mountains are moved. We're going to come into a place where kings take notice, where nations begin to turn, where we have righteousness in government offices, where we have righteousness in the judicial offices, where we have righteousness in our schools, righteousness first in our churches. That's how it's going to be, whether we like it or not. We're going to love it. That's how it's going to be. So whatever means we use to enter into the call of God in our lives is the means by which we will keep it. I love talking with young. I'm so grateful to God. And by the way, you can thank Phil Capuccio and Jesus for everything I'm sharing with you. This was the first teaching that I learned from Phil Capuccio in 1991 when I first joined with him at the church in Boston. And I had just finished usurping the leader of a summer camp, the one that Audrey and I met at and completely trashing the man who set, it, set me up so that I could have a position of authority. And I was an absolute mess with everything. I repented so hard and cried so hard for what I had done when he brought the word out about authority and, and a more extended teaching. It was a whole course on what I'm just kind of boil, boiling down for you today. And now I talk with young leaders who are experiencing people trying to take their position of authority and now I know to ask well tell me about how tell me your journey how did you come to that position of leadership and almost every time there's somewhere along the way where they did something to maneuver themselves into that position either manipulated during an interview pointed out a fault of the other one that possibly could have had that position you know you can name it all you've you've heard about it surely that there are many ways to move people out of the way to make room for yourself in a position. The problem is that now that's how you've got to hold on to it. If you, you, how many of you used to play King of the Mountain as kids? I mean, every boy in the room, raise your hand, you know it. Every pile of snow, that was the purpose of it. King of the Mountain. And how do you get to be King of the Mountain? You've got to drag everybody else down. You've got to knock people over. Hit them with an ice ball. Forget the snowball. Go right for the ice ball, right? You, got, you didn't play like that? 
You guys are looking at me like, you're so mean. I was New York City Steve, all right? Not current pastor Steve. I would never hit you with an ice ball. I'll still drag you off, though, for playing a game, but that's different. And that's the only way. And, and in the world's eyes and how the world operates, that's the only way to come into authority. The only way to advance yourself or be advanced is somebody else has to take a back seat. It's like as though all authority is a zero-sum game. How many of you know we were all called to rule and reign in Christ Jesus and nobody needs to be the boss of anybody when God's kingdom is established? I can't wait for the day that we don't even need leadership anymore. I'm going to go fishing on Cape Cod. Maybe I'll finally catch something this time. I became an expert caster. I don't know how to reel anything in yet except the lure that got caught on the weeds and now it's gone. Twelfth time. Somebody, somebody here needs to teach me how to fish. Anyway, that's just a side thing. Uh, at some point, we're not going to need it anymore because everybody has learned how to exercise authority and authority is not for the sake of telling other people what to do. It's for the sake of keeping the kingdom of God established so that darkness has no room to occupy it. That is paradise. That is Eden. And that serpent can sneak around and crawl around all he wants. He has no open door, no authority in that place. That's what we're aiming for. So, a key to holding and demonstrating God's heart is to trust His sovereignty. David said, look, as the Lord lives, either the Lord's going to strike him down, his day's going to come that he dies, or he'll go down in battle and perish. God's got a way. I don't know how He's going to do it. I thought I knew. Man, you'd asked me a few years ago when I was strumming my harp there and singing to Him and going out and fighting the king's battles. I thought I was a shoe in for the next position of king of Israel. And here I am in the wilderness being hunted around like a flea, as David put it. But somehow, I know that God's in control. That God's got this. That God somehow is going to make what the enemy intends for evil and He's going to work it for my good. And so I'm not going to work this thing out and I'm not going to figure it out. Anybody use that expression here? I just got to figure some things out. That is a dangerous thing to do. I'm sorry, I don't know. I mean, most of you are smarter than me. But now when I find myself thinking, oh, I got to figure this out. I go, stop! Just stop it right there. Don't figure anything out. Pause. And ask the Lord, Lord, could you set me back in a place where I trust you enough that what you spoke, you're also able to perform. You're going to do it. I don't know how this thing's going to happen, but you're going to do it. And I'm going to love that day. And the best part of it's going to be I'm going to have a real testimony. Not one of those testimonies where, hey, guess what I did to get in the position I'm in today. And hey, if you would just follow after me, you too can be uh, Whatever. It's not going to be that kind of testimony. It's going to be, if God could take a clown like me and do this, he surely could use somebody noble like yourself. That's, that's the best testimony that we could possibly have. I couldn't, God could, and here we are doing it. That's a glorious way to live life. Does that not already feel like 10,000 pounds got lifted off your shoulder? That we don't have to make the will of God come to pass? He's just said, walk with me be faithful, trust me. And for God's sake, this is God talking now. <laughs> Don't take matters into your own hands because I'll bail you out again. <laughs> that sheep I showed you a few weeks ago, it gets out of the crack. It goes bloop, 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 poof, right back in again. Like they said, Don't do that. It hurts. You, it hurts you. It hurts my heart. Don't do it like that. Trust me. Watch what I do. You'll be amazed and you'll live so free, you will never carry a burden again that I haven't graced you to carry because you're going to cast your cares on me because you know I care for you. This is one of my favorite scriptures, and it's not because it has to do with wives submitting to their husbands, but 1 Peter 2, verse 5, it says, For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves being submissive to their own husbands. Talking about Sarah and how she obeyed Abraham and how she followed him wherever he went as he was hearing God. It always said Abraham was talking with God, but guess who had to go wherever he went was his wife. And Sarah was no, no one to be, no, no one to be trivial, trivial, no one to trifle with. That's, thank you. No one to trifle with. Sarah is the prototype for the Jewish mother. 
You don't mess with a Jewish mother or a Jewish grandmother or a Dutch mom. Should I, can I, I'll bring it to you. You just don't mess with moms at all. Sarah is like that. Sarah is a force to be reckoned with. And all along, she could have just whined and kicked and screamed all the way. Sarah made it to Hebrews 11 too, that she didn't consider her body, you know, dead to life, but she trusted in the Lord. And so she gave birth to Isaac. But it says that the holy women also who hoped in God. In other words, she didn't have to trust Abraham. Because you know Abraham had issues. It, what I love in Romans 5 where it says Abraham did not waver in his faith. It's one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. Because if we looked at Abraham's life, we see how he lied and told Sarah twice, tell them you're my sister so they don't kill me. You know, and then the whole Ishmael thing, which, I mean, he could have blamed Sarah because it was her idea, but, but he, you know, he had a kid that became big problems still to this day. He had all kinds of issues like that. So Sarah's following Abraham, and the reason why she could follow him was because she could trust God to use even a man with faults to lead her. You could trust God. You know what the, the reason why God uses leaders who have problems and faults and even sin? It's because they're the only kind he has to work with. I mean, that's reality, right? So we don't follow a leader because they are deemed in whatever judgment we have is, well, you're honorable enough that I can honor you now or you're trustworthy enough that I can trust you now. Trusting your leadership because God put you in that place and I trust God even if I don't feel like I can trust you. Now that is David. That's having a heart like God's. A heart like God's says, I have such a confidence in God that I can stay with, like Daniel did, a king who thinks he's God. Minister to him because I trust God so much that I'll never get caught up in whatever his nonsense is. I can still serve the Lord even in a demonic place like this. That's trusting in God's sovereignty. So the key to holding, demonstrating God's heart toward mercy as David did, is to trust His sovereignty. I want to read a psalm over us that David wrote during this season probably of his life. It is a psalm of David, but it doesn't say when he wrote this one. But it probably reads like a wilderness psalm. And I want to um, just invite you to close your eyes for a second and absorb this and make David's cry. Now, this is David in the season he's in right now, as we're reading his life story. In the middle of his season, how did David do it? How could David have such a confidence in God that he could let his oppressor go free, knowing full well he's still got a spear and he's not afraid to use it, and now he's got 3,000 elite soldiers hunting him down? How could he let him go? when he had had opportunity to take care of business, this is how. This is David's heart, and I urge you to absorb it as your heart so that we'll never find ourselves as those who try to usurp authority that God's given, but rather take authority so that God can give authority to someone who will rule righteously. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a whole host encamp around me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. There's just one thing I've asked from the Lord, and that I may seek. Make this your prayer. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord, and to meditate in His temple. For in the day of trouble, He'll conceal me in His tabernacle. In the secret place of His tent, He'll hide me. He'll lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me, and I will offer in His tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, oh yeah, I will sing praises to the Lord. When you said, seek my face, my heart said, yes, Lord, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Don't hide your face from me. Don't turn your servant away in anger. You've been my help. Don't abandon me or forsaken me, O God, of my salvation. For my father and my mother may have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. 
Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Finally, a final exhortation. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Would you please stand to your feet? I want to proclaim that over you before we go and urge you to do it. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. The Lion of the tribe of Judah lives inside of you. So let your heart receive the courage that lives inside of you. Let it make your way from your inner man and your spirit man to your very heart itself so that you'll go from this place bold and courageous and ready to go into whatever situations are waiting for you when you walk out of these doors. May the Lord anoint you to bring good news in those places and continue to be the light of the world everywhere you go. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. I'll see you at four. I'll see you at four o'clock. Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. I'll see you at four. And I need